Um, and thank you so much for joining me this morning, David. Um, David, are you a professor yet or are you still a doctor of physics at Auckland University? I am a doctor of science specialised in physics. Specialised in of philosophy. Physics. Okay. okay. Yes. So you're, you're, a senior, you're a senior lecturer there. That's right. David, I've read just um, stories that have been uh, published and printed over the last uh, 24 hours in which, um, and, and rightly so, I think you've raised an incredibly important issue. Explain to me why you think nuclear has an immediate future for us and for Western economies in general. The idea is that um, we need a baseline power and many countries in the world are comfortable with using nuclear power to produce that stable, constant baseline power. And of course, renewable powers can add the top ups when there is an extra load um, during the middle of the day, for example. Um, and in the evenings, the renewables can uh, the, the energy saved by the renewables can s restore the energy, say, by pumping water back uphill to a reservoir. And so the reservoir becomes a giant battery that you're charging overnight from your renewable energy. But it's really this baseline power. And I think um, New Zealand looks at baseline power from the closest thing we have is, is, is geothermal power because the earth is always warm underneath us and that's a good source of geothermal uh, that's a good source of, of uh, consistent energy um, and we look at nuclear power um, as something that maybe New Zealand for whatever reason isn't interested in and and that's been ever since I've been here that's been his history in the last 27 years um, and I'm seeing that um, though there's now a sorry David uh, how long have you been in New Zealand I've been in New Zealand 27 years. I'm, I'm married to a Kiwi. Okay. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm not disputing your nationality. It's just that um, you're, you're <laughs> right. So you would have arrived in 1995. So it's roughly a, se correct. a central tenet of New Zealand. Uh, he can't be a New Zealander if you're not anti -nu if you're not um, yeah anti nukes really, isn't it? It's that's, that's what it seemed to me when I moved here, and, yep. and I, I still have that same impression. And you can see these television commercials that reinforce, you know. The New Zealand, the, the, the Steinlager beer commercials where mm. the Kiwis go out in their little boats and the French air pilots come and say, oh, they're, say, Nouvelle Zealand. Um, and that's fine. I mean, this is what sh this, this protest against uh, weapons testing um, shaped the culture, and, and nobody should apologize for that. Um, every, we understand that. I understand that. I think that um, for nuclear power um this is like a transitional energy for us because the renewable energies solar and and wind are becoming less and less expensive incredibly less expensive over the past five years or so and if we're not comfortable with nuclear energy then countries that have nuclear power can transition and this is this is what i was thinking of the transition for, between nuclear power and increased use of renewable energies. So that's what I'm really thinking. And I think personally, New Zealand um, can reach their our 100% renewable energy. Um, we may have problems with the uh, fluctuations, you know, um, uh, or we may have problems with baseline power, which might mean if we're not comfortable with nuclear, then the other option may be many more smaller geothermal plants like the type we already have. There's a new geothermal energy uh, coming online in the coming year or two. So I'm saying that we don't have to have nuclear power. I mean, we can achieve our 100% power uh, with the occasional glitch that um, we may uh, not have a windy day, for example. Um, but there are all alternatives to the baseline nuclear power. Um, on right. the other hand, we can... So, so, so let me just get the thesis right. Um, so what you're saying is, if we, we're trying to transfer into renewables, 100% renewable, we're trying to right. get rid of all the fossil... Yep, you're trying to get rid of all the fossil fuels, but... Exactly. 
the technology and the costing and all that sort of stuff, we can't get there yet. And you're suggesting for New Zealand, and we're a bit better off than most other countries in that respect of electricity generation because we've got geothermal and we've got hydro and we've got solar and we've got plenty of wind. Um, we, we may need something to get us there in the, in, the, in the short term and you're suggesting that nuclear power gives us that baseline guarantee. Is that right? Yes. Yes, but I'm not sure that we can, we'll have to define what short term means because building nuclear power plants, the conventional nuclear power plant has, oh, it's been scary that it practically doubled in the length of time that it takes. So it may take 10 to 15 years to build a working nuclear power plant, a full blown traditional nuclear power plant that might have several gigawatts of power. This is what we conventionally think of when we think of a nuclear power plant. And the cost has gone up tremendously. To well, um, I'm looking at Lake Onslow at the moment, billion. to be honest with you, um, and Lake, which yes. is very close to me, where I live. And um, they're not talking about that coming online till 2050. And the cost of that's going to yeah. be massive. So <laughs> nuclear is going to get here a lot quicker than that. In fact, the, it may not even be a traditional giant nuclear power plant because work is, is, is well, the, the smart players in, in, in around the world are looking at small modular reactors. These are things about the size of um, a house, for example. Yeah. And the idea is to get, get them down to uh, even smaller, like a shipping container size. But even say it's a house. Uh, these are showing... I mean, there's none running to produce power yet, but there are companies that um, are have the technology and are trying to uh, improve that technology so that this becomes a viable option. And in the coming years, I think that might be a better option rather than building one gigantic nuclear power plant in New Zealand. So a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of little small ones, essentially. Yeah, well, it may, it may not even be a lot. I mean, it depends on um, how much we base power we need to yep. make enough. And I, um, and, and and I assume have, that you'd put them there together. where populations were, um, just thinking yes, out loud, exactly. so that you don't risk, you don't lose generation um, over the thing. So, if, for example, Auckland, huge power need, you'd have it. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Interestingly, and, and I don't know if you know, long... but before you arrived in the country, um, David... Yeah. 1968, they actually planned a nuclear power plant for Kuiper Harbour. Um, oh, interesting. No, I didn't, wasn't yeah. aware of that. Yeah, um, and they did a lot of planning in the late 60s. It was abandoned in 1972, I think because they decided to build the Waitaki Dams or maybe they were coming yes, into operation okay. then. But, yeah, no, it's, it's, it has been considered before in New no, Zealand. That's interesting. So it's not, yeah, it's not a new idea no. to no. have a nuclear power plant. No. So people have thought about this. Yeah. Yes. That's interesting um, because it's relevant again, I think, as, as at least I don't see us spending $12 billion or uh, building a full, or $20 billion building a full-scale nuclear plant. But I'm, I'm, I have a certain optimism about these small modular reactors in the coming 10 or 20 years. I'm getting a lot of messages from listeners at the moment who are saying that they agree with you and that there are a number, uh, for example, Rolls-Royce are apparently building small nuclear power pods now. Um, sure. And there are a number of safe liquid salt reactors um, from nuclear power as well. Uh, is that the kind yeah, of thing you're thinking about? Modular. That's the kind of, yeah, that's the preferred way to go for, uh, they're looking at uh, a molten salt reactor is just where the coolant and the uranium are mixed together and and the coolant and the uranium flow together and you get your nuclear reactions in the coolant. So that's what the, the technical part for molten salt is and it's a, a chemical element that's in a liquid form, that's all. Um, so instead of just pure water, which is what regular nuclear reactors would use. So you're um, saying that the major problem would have been initially the setup costs, but you're saying that need yeah, not be the it case. It is a huge. Yeah, carry well, on. Well, it's a huge setup cost because there's a huge uh, and a huge carbon cost at the beginning because you've got to build. If, if we're talking about a conventional nuclear power plant, yeah, uh, the big, the big ones, um, 
there's a huge capital and 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 carbon cost in in the concrete and and building it is 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 environmentally expensive and it's capital intensive but then as the years go on that energy generation per unit fossil fuel gas carbon emission uh the energy that comes to that ratio um starts to become comparable to over 10, 20, 30 years, 40 years, becomes comparable to our current renewable energies. So you have this huge carbon cost at the beginning and a monetary cost, but then it, it flattens out because you no longer have to build anything. Mm. You perform regular maintenance, of course, and you have you have secondary problems, sources like trucks driving in with diesel fuel to power generators if, if necessary. But that's infinitesimally small compared to the huge carbon cost at the beginning. Um, so I, I feel more comfortable. Once you get over that big hurdle, and that, that's the big problem. And once you get over that big hurdle of, of building over 10 years or so, uh, then the next uh, 30 or 40 years, a lifetime of a conventional nuclear plant your your energy per cost ratio is is pretty good rivaling i mean both in carbon emission and in energy production that it, it rivals current uh, uh renewable sources um i don't think that anything you say is um frightening or alarming um because a number of i've noticed green politicians and ecologists in europe are saying the same thing that you are, that ironically, and they, they, they note the irony, but that ironically um, nuclear power is a safer, more environmentally friendly option than anything else that's being considered at the moment. Is that your view? Yes, but I, I would say that's closer to my view, uh, or my view is closer to their view, uh, however you want to look at it. Um, you just have to bite the bullet at the beginning and, and make that initial So our problem, hard our, pro cost. our problem isn't one of intellect. Our problem really is one of culture, do you think? The fact is that we've got this ingrained it's a, it, part it's of our a ethos. It's a problem, a cultural question. It's a, it's our, it's, a, it's a New Zealand cultural ethos. And, and New Zealanders ultimately have to fight that. And you, they shouldn't apologize for their current stand you know, against uh, nuclear power, but they should also recognize that maybe things aren't quite the way they seem. Um, most of the nuclear, uh, anti-nuclear feelings I've been getting is from weapons yes. testing. Yes, well, in actual fact, and can I give I you... I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Can I give you a bit of a lesson? Because before you sure. arrived in the country in 1990, what did we work out, 1995? Five, yeah. Um, We'd fought in a couple of elections in the 80s over this issue, or which had been an issue. I was a candidate in, in those elections. And it was never about nuclear power. It was about nuclear weapons and whether or not uh, United Nations or United States ships um, with potentially yeah. nuclear weapons on board should be allowed to visit New Zealand um, as part of that sort of shell game. So the argument sure. was, I mean, we've always opposed testing in, you know, the South Pacific. That's fair enough. That's a different matter. But yes. it wasn't about, in fact, we had our own reactor in this country. Um, Canterbury University had a nuclear reactor. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was always about the weapons and somehow it morphed and evolved into nuclear power. Well... I, I'm a, I totally agree with the weapons. Uh, that's what makes me uncomfortable. That's the most uncomfortable thing, using enriched uranium, which, um, I mean, and then we have to be honest, nuclear power is a child from a nuclear weapons development program in the 19th, Second World War. Mm. And it became using uranium instead of another isotope called thorium, another uh, radioactive isotope, which may have been less problematical, but that was, that's in history now. Um, so we use enriched uranium, and it, we, your listeners might be interested to know that um, Australia for a long time was shipping um, what is called a, a processed form of uranium. Remember, they mine uranium in Australia, 
and we get uranium ore and uranium in Canada and, and Kazakhstan, for example, are, not, are three places that are particularly rich with uh, uranium ores. But they do some chemical processing and turn that uranium ore into uranium oxide, and it's called yellow cake. And this material gets shipped through Auckland harbors, at least in the early uh, you know, 2010s around there. I'm not sure if it's still doing that. But for decades, that kind of material was already passing through um, New Zealand uh, harbors. Granted, it's not weapons at grade uranium, and it may be in comparable radioactivity to the uranium ore, maybe slightly less even than uranium ore, but it was still uranium ore that was part of the nuclear fuel chain that was passing through Auckland. Mm. So mm. ships were carrying, you know, a type of uranium that was going to be processed by the Americans, for example, into uh, nuclear power, enriched uranium to maybe 5 or 7% of the uranium-235, which is the one that fissions instead of the motor, more common U-238, the heavier cousin. And then weapons is 10 to 20, or maybe 20% enrichment. Okay. But New Zealand was already part of this nuclear, yeah. nuclear fuel chain. Yeah. And... and I'm not sure how many people were actually were aware of this. No, well, probably nobody, to be fair. Um, can I just say thank you for coming on the show this morning? Um, I think it's My a pleasure. very important conversation that we have, and we shouldn't shy away from it just because of past ideology. Um, very best of luck to you, Dr. Krovchik. It's nice to talk to you. All right, Michael, thank you very much for having me on the show. Thank you very much. Ta. All right, um, that's, well, you know, you've listened to that conversation, Senior Lecturer in Physics at Auckland University. A very strong believer that nuclear power is an option for us. Um, and I just want to know this morning if you agree. Okay. <laughs>